Hello again, welcome to this lecture. We are going to now talk more about bioinformatics. And so if we look at this um, image that I have here, you can see bioinformatics going down. And all of the other different related disciplines to bioinformatics are essentially kind of um, you know, shown here on this thing where bioinformatics covers topics from bi bi biology to biotech to evolution to informatics to met um, metabolism to molecular modeling to proteomics and finally, you know, ending up with things like genomics and statistics. It's, it's really um, this amazing union of all of these different fields of um, uh, in, in the sciences. Um, and so we're going to just kind of dive into a couple of different areas of bioinformatics to give you a flavor of this today. I'll just remind you of some of the learning objectives we want you to get off this so you don't get overwhelmed. We, we, at the end, you should be able to describe the process of DNA sequencing, demonstrate how to reconstruct a long sequence, um, DNA sequence from a bunch of smaller sequences, and then employ the bioinformatic tool BLAST um, to, to, in order to compare sequences. So we'll look at that as well. So first of all, I want you to imagine that you go to a restaurant and maybe you like to eat sushi and so you're, you're there and they serve you uh, some sushi and it's really expensive, it's like $100 and it's supposed to be, you know, bluefin tuna, okay? But as you're eating it, you're like, I don't know if this is bluefin tuna and, and, and you'd really like to know whether or not they gave you, you know, some other type of fish instead of bluefin tuna. Um, by the way, I saw this article that um, from 2012 where there was a one fish that was sold for $730,000. Um, as far as I can tell, it's one of the most expensive fish fishes ever sold before, right? And that's because these types of fish are used in these really high-end restaurants that serve these sushi. So it would be really important to know if indeed you're eating bluefin tuna or, you know, instead of tilapia or some other um, fish that maybe wouldn't be as expensive. So to do this, we've got to learn, we, we, we know that um, you could actually take a sample, like if you took a little bit of that sushi, put it in, a, in your napkin or whatever, and and, and then brought it to me in class, I could take that down to my lab and I could determine whether or not that was bluefin tuna or some other species of fish or of any animal for that matter. And we would do that by looking at the DNA, right? So how do we do this? Well, what I want you to imagine right now is if I were to give you these strips of DNA, right, and had you cut along these lines here so that now they were all independent, okay? So I've got them all now cut apart. Now I want you to do is like take these strips of paper and kind of try to line them up. So if you visually kind of start looking back and forth, you know, you could line these up. And I'll post these, these papers uh, online so you can cut these out and actually try this if you'd like. But you slide them along and you go and you go and you go and eventually you might find a couple ends that tend to match up. So for example, if we look right here, we can see that the pattern C-A-G-G-C-A-A-T-C-T-T is also found on the beginning of this sequence down here, C-A-G-G-C-A-A-T-C-T-T. And if we look for another pattern where it's the same on one end and on the other end, maybe we would have seen this, C-C-A-T-T-A-T, C-C-A-T-T-A-T. And perhaps you, you saw this one, G-A-G-T-G-T, C-A-T-C-T-A-T-T, -T -T, right? And the same thing down below. And perhaps if you keep looking, you would continue to find all of these areas where there are these matching DNA, uh, these matching letters, right? This sequence of DNA letters that match up from one end of a sequence uh, to another end on a different sequence. And if you were to think about that and you were to take these, then you could like, if they're all cut, uh, cut apart, you can move them and they could be lined up to something like this where the greens lined up and then the yellows and then the reds and then I've kind of just continued this forward down through over here where the, the, here's the blues that line up and, the, and this other lighter blue, the purples and you know this orange color over here. And if you did that right across everything, eventually you've got one big long stretch of DNA where you've been able to put everything um, together and so from small pieces of DNA that overlap, you can actually reconstruct a very long, large piece of DNA. And this is exactly what has been done for many, 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 many organisms, including humans, where 
we have gone in and figured out small stretches of DNA and then put those small stretches of DNA together to form large pieces of DNA. So for example, you can take a human, take all of its chromosomes, all of its DNA, chop it up as we learned you can do this with restriction enzymes, these little molecular scissors. You can take those fragments and if you do this enough times on enough pieces of DNA, you'll end up with um, enough overlapping segments that then you can eventually put together the entire genome again. We also learned that if we're only interested in certain regions of DNA, we can take that we can do PCR and amplify just those specific reason, regions where we start off with initial, initial segment, we use, the, we use the thermal cycler machine again, and we end up again with millions of double-stranded DNA molecules of that same DNA segment. And once we have those millions of um, th those different segments, though, how do we actually read the genetic code? So this is what I want to talk about next. How would we actually go through and read these little fragments, or how would we read all of these PCR fragments that we've created? So to do this, I want you to envision this exercise. So imagine that I've given you um, strips of DNA, and all that I'm showing you is the very last letter. And so I ask you, arrange these things in order of size. Because remember, we can actually do that on a gel if we wanted, right? I could have you run these out on a gel, and they should arrange according to size. And if you did this, you'd end up with you know, a pattern this direction or the other direction, depending on how you're looking at your gel. And if you did this then, what you've actually now started to do is arrange these pieces of DNA one letter at a time, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, let's assume that that you, what you want to do again is you want to read a stretch of DNA. Well, if I could take an entire stretch of DNA, so think about, you know, right down here at the bottom. I don't know what all of these other letters are. What I'd like to know is what they are. Well, if I can somehow work to where I have increasingly smaller segments all the way back until I have just one, you know, nucleotide, I could put that together and then I could read the genetic code. So the genetic code for this stretch of DNA here would be GGCCTTCCCTCGAAT. And that is the that that method of doing that is actually what um, some scientists came up with in order to sequence DNA. So it's done in this way where you have in a little vial again you put in there your DNA which can either either be you know the DNA uh, which is like the DNA from these millions of of uh, sequence reads that you've done from a PCR, or it could be tons and tons of genomic DNA that you've cut up with restriction enzymes. But you put your DNA in here, um, also with a little bit of water, and then you can put in um, primers that will go in and target right specific areas of the genome. For example, if we just did PCR, we would target use the same primers or very similar primers um, for what we just used in PCR. We also would add a polymerase. So once again, we're going to add a polymerase, TAC polymerase, that functions at high temperatures. And we're going to use this polymerase um, to help us go along and, re and once again copy these segments of DNA. But this time we're going to add, um, we're also going to add also uh, free nucleotides like we have before, the A's, C's, um, T's, and G's. But we're going to add one thing, one other thing that's very different as well. We're going to add nucleotides that have been tagged with a fluorescent dye. Now, we're not going to add very many of those. We're going to add a few, but not very many. And, and these nucleotides are different because they also, once they're added, no other nucleotides can be added after them. Okay? And so what we're expecting is that the, the, a very similar process to PCR is going to happen where you're going to start copying part of the, of the DNA sequence, but as soon as one of, by random chance, one of these um, fluorescent nucleotides is grabbed by the polymerase and, and put on to the growing DNA strand, first of all, you stop replicating. You don't replicate anymore. And then that very last nucleotide has this fluorescence that can be read by a laser. So if we look over here, we can assume that you know, each one of these growing segments were getting longer and longer, but then they randomly grabbed a nucleotide that, was fl that had the fluorescent dye. And so as it's reading along the tempa template strand, this one happened to grab 
of course, the, the corresponding base for T. And so it has a particular base that's uh, or color that it fluoresces when it's read by a laser that, that looks at this. The A is, is, red, uh, is red here, the G and the C and so forth. And what you end up with is as you're pulling this sample down through this, this really small capillary tube that, is sense, that in essence is filled with a gel, and when it's filled with a gel, we know that the smallest pieces are going to go first. So you're going to get the smallest pieces coming through this gel, and their laser is reading across this gel, and as the laser reads, it reads off the different bases. So once again, we, we can look back over here now and say, okay, here's that first base that's red, the second base that's red, the third base, and it's red because these are the samples that are coming along this laser. So these different piece, sized pieces come down this capillary and there being this capillary system, there's the laser with the detector and the detector reads each of the different uh, nucleotide, fluorescent nucleotides, right, that are on each of these successively smaller or larger uh, segments of DNA. And then that gets all recorded in a computer and then eventually that get, then can be um, given to the investigator and what we see is this chromatograph which are all of these different peaks that show each of the different nucleotides and that can then be interpreted into DNA data. So here's an example of a um, mayfly that I sequenced and so you can go down and you can see that we started to interpret the genetic code of this mayfly. You know, here we are reading T, 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 G, T, T, A, A, G, A, T, G, G, C, A, G, A, and so forth, all the way down. And that's how we read these fragments of DNA. And then these fragments of DNA can be overlapped, like we've shown, to reproduce the entire genome. So all of this data has been being collected and is deposited on these data banks, these databases that are available. And so the one that we're going to look at is from a website called NCBI. Um, that stands for National Center for Biotechnology Information. And if you put just in, you know, in Google NCBI, you will come up with this website. So we're going to go ahead and do that.